Premanande Haribo Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Pricharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatari Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya This evening we are reading from Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 2, contents of the Gita summarized, sloka number 44. Bhogaishvarya prasaktanam, Bhogaishvarya prasaktanam, Taya parita chetasam, Vaya vasayatmika buddhi, Samadau na vidyate, Bhogaishvarya prasaktanam, Ayaparita chetasam, Vaya vasayatmika buddhi, Samadau na vidyate, Bhogaishvarya prasaktanam, Bhogaishvarya prasaktanam, Kaya parita chetasam, Vaya vasayatmika buddhi, Samadau na vidyate, Bhogeshwarya Prasaktana, Bhogeshwarya Prasaktana, Bhagrita Chetasa, Bhagrita Chetasa, Sayatmika Buddhi, Sayatmika Buddhi, Samadhona Vidhiyate, Samadhona Vidhiyate. Madhuji? Bhogeshwarya Prasaktana, Bhogeshwarya Prasaktana, Chaitasam, bewildered in mind, Vaya Vasaya Atmika, 
fixed in determination. Buddhi, devotional service to the Lord. Samadhao, in the controlled mind. Na, never. Vidyate, does take place. Translation. In the minds of those who are too attached to sense enjoyment and material opulence and who are bewildered by such things, the resolute determination for devotional service to the Supreme Lord does not take place. You can all please repeat. In the minds, In the minds of those who are too attached, those who are too attached to sense enjoyment, to sense enjoyment and, material opulence, and material opulence and who, who are bewildered, and who are bewildered by, such things, by such things. The resolute determination, the resolute determination for, devotional for devotional service to the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Lord does, not does not take place. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Samadhi means fixed mind. The Vedic dictionary, the Narukti, says, Samyak adiyate smin atmatatva yatatnyam. When the mind is fixed for understanding the self, it is said to be in samadhi. Samadhi is never possible for persons interested in material sense enjoyments and bewildered by such temporary things. They are more or less condemned by the process of material energy. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Sakaya Akshur Sadvaitam Sabadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishaka Nitamscha He Krishna Parana Sindhu Hina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindapanishwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Vayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Krishna is instructing Arjuna in the process of yoga. And he is pointing out some obstacles which are there in the path of spiritual life. These two things are mentioned, boga and aishwarya. <laughs> this word boga was, uh, there's an interesting story about the word boga that uh, the, the devotees in the temple 
Prabhupada was telling them, uh, make sure you have lots of boga. And the, the devotees didn't know what boga was, you know, and they were wondering, what, what is that preparation? You know, we never, nobody showed us how to make boga before. We, <laughs> it was a big puzzle to them what they were supposed to do, how to prepare boga. And then when Prabhupada finally arrived, he explained that boga means what you have before you offer it to Krishna. Once it's offered to Krishna, then it becomes prasada. But before offering it to Krishna, it's called boga. When you go to the market, you go to the market to purchase the boga, right? And then you bring the boga back from the market, and then you cook, and then you offer to Krishna, and the boga becomes prasada. So here in this verse, Prabhupada has translated the word boga as sense enjoyment, sense pleasure. Sometimes the person in charge of the kitchen will say, who's taken all the boga? <laughs> you know, the person's trying to run the kitchen and he thinks he has a lot of boga and somebody else comes along and they make a big preparation, use up all the boga. And there's no ghee left or there's no sugar left or something. And so something they say, who's taking the boga? Boga means sense gratification. Now, we should understand sense gratification and also aishwarya, material opulence, are not wrong. And in fact, they're both also relative. It will be different for different people. What is opulence for a Singapore person? You know, it, it may not be so opulent for someone from Los Angeles. You know, somebody in Singapore may think, oh, so luxurious. But somebody in Los Angeles may think, wow, ordinary <laughs> or middle class or something. You know, you know, it's a relative thing. People in Singapore, people in, in India, in a village in India may think people in Singapore are living in opulence. It may be considered compared to people in a village in India. But, you know, for other parts of the world, not everyone considers Singapore to be so opulent. It's very relative. That's the point. And similarly, sense gratification is also relative. Just like when it comes to eating. Somebody eats a lot and somebody can eat very little. You know, we know some ladies, they, they eat like a sparrow. They eat very little, you know. But somebody else, oh, they can eat so much, you know. And they say, well, is there any more? <laughs> yeah. You know, different strokes for different folks. Different people, and they have to eat according to their nature. Some people can eat lots and digest very quickly. And other people eat a little bit and have a, still don't digest it. So it's different for different people. However, Lord Krishna is not pointing out that sense gratification and opulence are wrong. Don't misunderstand what Krishna is saying here. Sometimes people think, oh, it's wrong to be opulent. Oh, it's wrong to have sense gratification. No, but what is wrong is if you're overly attached to it. If the attachment to these things is excessive, that is a problem. If, you're, if we're bewildered by it, if our minds become disturbed by it, that is what Lord Krishna is concerned about. We want to come to the stage of samadhi in the purport Prabhupada's talking about having a fixed mind, controlling our mind, making the mind steady. And the, 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 the criterion for controlling the mind is that you're not disturbed by different conditions. We saw the example of His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, how he could come to Hong Kong. 
Now, when he came to Hong Kong, the devotee in charge of the center there arranged that he would greet Prabhupada in a Rolls Royce car. It was the Rolls Royce belonging to a very wealthy Indian man who lived in Hong Kong. And he arranged to have his Rolls Royce greet Prabhupada. And he also arranged for Srila Prabhupada to stay in the penthouse suite in one of the best hotels in Hong Kong. So newspaper reporters were invited to meet Srila Prabhupada. And they were saying to Prabhupada, Oh, Swamiji, you know, isn't this a bit excessive for a holy man that you came in the Rolls Royce and now you're here in this penthouse suite in the hotel? But Srila Prabhupada simply replied to them, If I was to sit under a tree, you wouldn't come to see me. <laughs> Hmm. And similarly also, I remember in London uh, in the early 1970s when gurus, spiritual leaders were very prominent in the news and then there were some spiritual, so-called spiritual leaders who were famous or infamous rather for having fleets of luxury cars and we were the Hare Krishna movement who were seen every day on the streets of London wearing our bed sheets <laughs> and one blue sock and one red sock you know in other words we didn't even have matching socks you see. <laughs> we were very simple we were known to be very simple living you know we had a temple and it was a, a basic temple and people could come and they would be given prasadam. So, but we had a reputation, we had the respect of the public there that we were simple living. And so some reporters who visited the center, they were inquiring from Prabhupada about these spiritual leaders on, with big cars, that they're all cheaters. But Srila Prabhupada said, well, the cheater may ride a bicycle. And the one who's riding in the big car, he may be a genuine teacher. You do not judge by the vehicle. You don't judge by how they, what kind of transport they have. You have to hear what they're teaching. You have to examine how they live. And so in the same way, Lord Krishna is warning all of us here. We should not be bewildered. We shouldn't be overly attached to these two things, material opulence and sense gratification. We shouldn't be too much attached to them, neither should we be averse to them. Now there's some interesting examples of people who were averse to opulence. For example, Sudama Vipra was a very great devotee of Lord Krishna. But he was very attached to being poverty-stricken. He wouldn't even go out and beg. Now as a brahmana, he had the right to go out and beg. But he wouldn't go out and beg. And he and his wife were living in abject poverty. He had nothing. And even when it came to Sudama having to go to Dwarka to see Lord Krishna, he wanted to take something, to bring something to offer to Krishna. But they had nothing. His wife had to go. His wife had to go and beg. Sudama couldn't go and beg. I can't beg. I'm not going to go. But his wife went and got some dry rice from some neighbor. And Sudama took that to Dwarka with him. So Sudama was averse to opulence. And you see the result. After he went to Dwarka and he came back from Dwarka, Krishna gave him all the opulence. Krishna wanted to let him know that it's not correct to be against opulence or to be averse to these things. Krishna doesn't care about that. What he does care about is that inner mood, the consciousness, the loving devotion. 
Now someone may live in opulence and they may have great devotion for the Lord. We see wonderful examples of some devotees who were very opulent. For example, Maharaj Prataparudra, the king of Utkal, in the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He was a king, a ruler with a huge kingdom. So certainly he was opulent. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was refusing to meet him because he said he's a king, he's a worldly person. But, of course, Maharaj Prataparudra showed himself to be a very great devotee of the Lord. And he actually just said that when Lord, when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu refused to meet him, he said, then I will give up my kingdom, I will... I do not follow this. I will give up being king and I will simply go and live by begging. I don't want to be the king anymore. He, he, had, he was not attached to his opulence. He wanted just to be able to have darshan of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That meant more to him than any amount of opulence. Another great devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who was very opulent was Pundarik Vijanidhi. Pundarik Vijanidhi was a wealthy landowner and when he came to Navadvi, Makunda told Gadarhar Pandit, a great devotee has come, you must go and meet him. Now Gadarhar Pandit was a brahmachari and very renounced his whole life. So he came to meet Pundarik Vijanidhi, he came to see Pundarik Vijanidhi, and when he saw this Pundarik Vijanidhi, he was shocked. He saw this person sitting on a big seat and dressed in very fine clothes and rings on every finger and hair all very nicely set and big array of numpkins and sweetmeats all before him, different sherbets, all kinds of things for his enjoyment. One servant was fanning him with a peacock fan, another servant was using the chamara, and Pundarik Vijanidhi was sitting there, and Gadarhar Pandit saw all this, and he thought, how can he be a great devotee? He cannot be a devotee, he's a materialist. He's a Vishayi. And Gudarha Pandit was disgusted. He was going to leave. But Makunda could understand the mind of Gudarha Pandit. And Makunda began to sing a beautiful verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam describing how Lord Krishna is so merciful that although Putana came before him with poison on her nipple, and wanted to feed that poison to Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna accepted her and delivered her to the spiritual world to become one of his nurses in the spiritual sky. So there's a beautiful verse describing this and Makunda, who was very expert, very well known for his singing, he recited that verse. And when he recited that verse, then Pundarik Vijanidhi, when he heard that verse, then his bhava awakened within him and he became overwhelmed with ecstatic love for the Lord. And he fell from his seat and he rolled on the floor shedding tears and the whole floor became flooded with the tears from his eyes. And he was rolling and crying out for the Lord and he remained in that condition for many hours. So Gadarhar was a witness to this. And when he saw that display of emotional ecstasy from Pundarik Vijanidhi, then Gadarhar could understand that actually Pundarik Vijanidhi was a very great devotee. And Gadarhar then regretted that he had made a mistake. He made a great offense even by thinking him to be a materialist. So the point is we shouldn't judge people externally. 
we have to look internally. We have to see the internal symptoms. Material opulence and sense gratification are allowed to be used in the service of Krishna. Just like Prabhupada gave devotees a lot of sense gratification, nice prasada, right? That's not material sense gratification. That is spiritual sense gratification. Enjoying nice foodstuffs offered to Krishna. I remember distributing, you know, we have these cookbooks, so the, the devotee in Australia, Kurma Prabhu, does he come here sometimes? Kurma? No? Kurma, anyway, famous cook in Australia. He's published a number of books about cooking, and you can see the pictures, you know, very beautiful, opulent dishes. So I remember on one occasion in Taiwan, we were distributing these books, and Taiwan is a Buddhist country. And so, the, you know, the Buddhists are vegetarian, but, you know, if you ever eat Buddhist food, you know, it's very tasteless, you know. To say the least, you know, it doesn't have taste, you know, because they consider if it's too tasty, that's sense gratification. So, I remember showing the book, the pictures of the vegetarian dishes to some Buddhists. They said, "Oh, this looks very sensual. This is just sense gratification." You know, we would say Maya, and he was—he he didn't say Maya, but he said, "This is." Just material enjoyment. You people just eat all these nice dishes for the pleasure of your tongue. He could not understand that, no, we, we cook for Krishna. Krishna is Bhagavan, and he deserves the best. We cook opulent dishes for his pleasure, not for our own pleasure. We're doing it for the pleasure of Krishna. A Buddhist cannot understand this. It's beyond their mind, you know, beyond the ability of their limited mind and senses to understand that there's a supreme personality of Godhead and that we are his servants. However, this is our principle, that we satisfy the senses of Krishna. And by satisfying the senses of Krishna, we also feel pleasure. Just like opulence, the proper use of opulence is in the service of Krishna. We have wealth, we use it to build big temples for the worship of the Lord. And as devotees, we're not expected to just live in mud huts. But we should live in this, this, a similar standard to how other people live. And Prabhupada liked to see that. He didn't expect that devotees had to be, you know, like Goswamis living under a different tree every night. <laughs> you know, that's not required in this age. Rather, we have to show people how to use everything in the service of Krishna, what we call yukta vairagya, renunciation in relation to Krishna. So we accept opulence and sense gratification in relation to Krishna. Nice cars, we also use cars to go and preach, to go out and visit people. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada the spiritual master of our own founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, he was innovative in utilizing this principle given to us by Rupa Goswami of using everything in the service of Krishna. Previously, before his time, holy men or sadhus or sannyasis would walk barefooted everywhere. They would go walking barefoot. But he came in a big car. But he would use 
that opulence to impress the leaders of the government, different political heads and statesmen, and to get their attention, impress them, and in this way he was able to bring them to Mayapur and to show them the holy dam of Mayapur and to establish what was the actual birthplace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was revolutionary in this matter. Other holy men were walking barefooted and he would ride in a big car. Was it Maya? No, we have to understand the inner consciousness that he was accepting that opulence and to use it in the service of Lord Krishna. So in a similar manner, we can also utilize material opulence. Sense gratification. Srila Prabhupada talks about sense gratification. He said, everyone needs some sense gratification. He gives an example. If you cook and you don't put any salt, then no taste. The food doesn't taste good. And if you put too much salt, then it's also not good. Taste is wrong. Oh, disgusting, too much salt. Sense gratification has to be there. How much sense gratification are we allowed? That is given to us by the scriptures. The scriptures guide us in the proper amount of sense gratification. The scriptures don't say that you have to you have to starve, but they say don't eat meat, fish, and eggs. Eat pure food. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also says, don't eat too much. Don't eat too little. He didn't say, just eat three mouthfuls, or just eat nine mouthfuls. You know, some people do that kind of austerity in Chaturmashya. They regularly count how many mouthfuls of food they eat. So Lord Krishna doesn't do that. But what he does say is, don't eat too much, don't eat too little. In other words, it's going to be different for different people. Some people need to eat more. Some people can eat very less. It will vary for people. But you eat too much, you get a problem. Diabetes. You eat too little, you get a problem. Tuberculosis. I was giving a class one night in, in Malaysia and there were, there were three diabetics and one person with TB <laughs> yeah, among the class. And had a small class, it was only about 20 people. <laughs> it's very interesting. So we have to be very conscious to maintain health. We're given the material body and when we use it properly, then we maintain good health. When we don't use it properly, when we abuse it, you get sick. We have to learn what is the proper regulated <coughs> activities for good health. And so the activities of the senses are all regulated for us according to scripture. When we are guided by the scripture, then we're safe we can be sure that no harm will come to us. We want to take direction from the scriptures. And if you're not able to follow scripture or understand properly the message of the scripture, then the spiritual teachers, sadhu, shastra, and guru, right? So sadhu and guru are also there. We can get advice from them, inquire from them and they can tell us properly. Just like sleeping, Srila Prabhupada encourages us don't sleep too much, or in Bhagavad Gita rather, Lord Krishna is saying, don't sleep too much, don't sleep too little. We cannot imitate Arjuna. Arjuna could stay awake all night. We can't do that. 
we have we sleep, but don't sleep too much. Don't sleep too little. Prabhupada recommends, he said, six, seven hours should be sufficient for everyone. But again, it will be different. Some people may be engaged in very uh, tiring, exhausting work. They need to take more rest. Sometimes somebody may do physical work, may, may not be as tiring as mental work. The mental energy can make a person more exhausted than physical labor. And so if you're doing a lot of intense mental energy, you're using a lot of intense mental energy, then you may have to have more rest. But not, don't take too much, because sleeping, Prabhupada said, like death. Consciousness is gone. We're not aware. We don't want to waste the valuable human life. So, Lord Krishna is warning us here, if we want to have a, a steady mind, we should not be bewildered by material opulence and sense gratification. Some people become very absorbed in how to increase their opulence. They think, oh, we don't have enough. Oh, a new iPhone is out and I don't have the new model. How, how can I live? I haven't got the latest iPhone. Oh, I'm so ashamed to go out there in front of my friends. Some people think like that. You know, it becomes a problem. We become attached to that status. So we have to learn to be indifferent to these different conditions of the material world. Keep the mind steady. If Krishna wants you to have these things, he will give them without extra endeavor. We, should, we shouldn't be over endeavoring to get more opulence and sense gratification. That is a mistake. If we will sacrifice all of our time and energy just simply for economic development, that's not very intelligent. Because that economic development is finished with the body. Material opulence, sense gratification. That is for people with a small brain. Alpha medasa, right? People who worship the demigods, the devas, they get results which are limited and temporary. So why should we waste this valuable human life endeavoring just simply for economic development and sense gratification? Just accept what comes of its own accord by the grace of Krishna and be happy in that situation. That is samadhi, that is controlled mind. We want to be peaceful, we have to learn how to be detached. How can we become, be how can we ever become detached? We have to replace all the activities of sense gratification with spiritual practice. We have to have a good sadhana, in other words, we spend time every day to chant the holy name and to hear scriptures like Bhagavad Gita. If we're not hearing scriptures and chanting the holy name, then certainly we'll easily become prone to all the passion of the material world. The material energy is very powerful. It is Krishna's energy. And when we forget Krishna, then Maya comes in, immediately grabs us and takes us into the modes of nature. And we forget Krishna, we've for forgotten Krishna, we become a, a puppet of the material energy one thing after another, 
we're simply concerned. I want more opulence. I want more sense gratification. Remember how Lord Krishna had described that lust is never satisfied. It burns like fire. We have to understand the nature of material desire. Material desire, sense gratification. Economic development is just simply another way of saying sense gratification. We all think we think about these things. Okay, you can think about, but don't think too long about them. Don't be too worried about these things. Just accept what comes by the grace of God and be happy. Keep the mind controlled. And in order to do that, you have to have spiritual practice. And spiritual practice is done every day not just once a week, right? You come here maybe once or twice a week or on the weekend, but the, what do you do the rest of the week? Monday to Friday? Oh, well, do all my chanting on Saturday. Make up for all the bad things I've done Monday to Friday. Make up for all my, bad, my sins on, on the weekend. And then go back to sinful life again. That's not good. That's not the way. If we are sincere in our spiritual practice, we have to do it regularly. I'm talking daily, every day. Just like medicine. Usually medicine, you take it daily. So in the same way, our spiritual practice requires daily practice. Every day we have to chant the holy name. Every day we want to hear from the scriptures. We have this valuable human life. If we just waste it in in-depth working hard for sense gratification, then at the end of life, what do you have to show? You will leave all your iPhones and computers and cars and everything. They're all left behind. We don't take them with us when we go. All of the money, the bank balance and everything, it's all left behind. We cannot take anything with us. Of course, we do take our karma. We do take our desires with us to the next level. So we want to actually get rid of all of our karma by the end of this life. We want to become free of karma. <coughs> our food, the prasadam which we eat, that is called karma-free diet. There's no karma there because the food is offered to Krishna. Generally, our, our activities are all laden with karma. Some fruit of desire is there. And that keeps us in the material world. We want to get free from this material world. Why come back? Why come back here to this place? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Mamo Paitya Punarjanma Dukala Yamashasvatam. Napno vanti mahatmana samsadim paramamgata. Those great souls who are yogis in devotion, they never return to this material world because they know it to be a temporary place of misery. Srila Prabhupada talks about this word dukalaya. He said, just like you have grantalaya, the place of books. And you have uh, Bhojanalaya, place of food, Himalaya, place of snow. So, Dukalaya, this planet, place of misery. Even in Singapore, can you say there's no misery here? <laughs> Everywhere, 
Abrama Bhuvana Loka, Punara Vartanu Arjuna, Mamu Pecha Tukuntiya Punar Janma Navitati. From the highest planet in the universe down to the lowest, all are places of misery. You know, devotees were sometimes were not very realistic, you know. Just like in, in America, devotees often think, I want to go to Hawaii. Because Hawaii is, you know, very nice climate, you know, weather's very mild. If you're in New York or Boston, it's very cold. The winter's very cold, very bad. Well, you should go to Hawaii. Everyone wants, they want to go to Hawaii. But in Hawaii, people are also suffering. Everywhere also, they also suffer the material energy. The miseries of life are there. The misery, Adi Bautik, the miseries of the body, the mind, it's there everywhere, wherever you go. You do not change your karma just by going to another place. The karma is the same. You go to the jungle, you go and live in the forest, you take your mind with you. Right? Our desires go with you. I met one young man, he had been living in a cave for two months. He said his mind was worse after two months when he came out of the cave. He had more desires than he had when he went in the cave. <laughs> so, <laughs> just changing the material situation doesn't take away our karma, doesn't change our desire. But if we do spiritual practice, if we engage in the process of bhakti yoga, that can change our karma. It burns up all the sinful desires, all the karmas destroyed simply through the activities of devotion to Krishna. So Lord Krishna is encouraging Arjuna that uh, the path of the Vedas, it can take you to the higher planets and can give you sense gratification. But that's not the goal. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be attracted to these things. If we, if we want to go back to Godhead, we have to be indifferent to these things. There's a very nice verse in uh, the scriptures which says Narayana Parasarve Nakutaschanya Vibhyate Swarga Apavarga Narakesh Vapitu Yatadashana So this verse is describing the position of a devotee who has surrendered themselves fully to Lord Narayan the Supreme Lord It says the devotees of Lord Narayan do not see any difference between Swarga Apavarga and Narak. Swarga, heaven. Apavarga, liberation. And Narak, hell. For a devotee of the Lord, these places are all the same. He sees them all the same. Heaven, hell, and liberation. There's no difference. Because wherever the devotee goes, He's going to do his service for Krishna. He's going to chant the holy name. He's going to worship Krishna, offer his food to Krishna. Just like devotees, wherever they go, they have the same program. Wake up early in the morning, chant the holy name, go to Mongol Arti, do Tosi Puja, and then cook for Krishna, hear Srimad Bhagavatam, like that. Wherever they go, it doesn't matter if they're in Singapore, or if they're in Vrindavan, or in Los Angeles, wherever they go, they're doing the same thing, it's the same program. It's the same program. Every center of Krishna consciousness around the world, they have the same program every day. That is 
the, the beauty of Krishna consciousness, that the mind can be controlled through that spiritual practice. When we have that regulated lifestyle, then our mind will be peaceful and calm. People are so, they say, I'm, I'm, I'm so much stress, I have so much anxiety. Why? You cannot be chanting Hare Krishna. You're not, if you, if you see you are chanting, then you're not chanting enough. You need to chant more. You need to hear more. If we do these activities, we won't be disturbed. We'll be immune to all the difficulties of life. And we see nice examples, devotees, how they tolerate so many difficulties and they go on with their life, every day chanting, serving Krishna. You want to control the mind, there's a science, there's a process, you do it. You just take part in these activities. You stay with the devotees, come and stay with the devotees. Every day you can do that program, waking up early, chanting the whole every morning. It's so satisfying. One one uh, Indian lady I know, uh, she she's a disciple of Gopal Krishna Maharaj, and her husband <coughs> was working in China, so uh, she went with him to China, and. Uh, she wanted to go and stay in our center in Hong Kong. So we arranged that she could go there and stay in the temple in Hong Kong. And she stayed there for a few weeks and she said it was so wonderful every day to have the full program in the temple with the devotees. She said, I feel so peaceful and happy. A practical example. You, when you do these things, you. You know, take advantage of the Krishna conscious center to hear and chant. Then we forget all the anxieties of life. It's all forgotten about by serving Krishna. So that is Yukta Vairakya, using everything for the service of Krishna. There's other kinds of Vairagya, Baugu Vairagya, giving up everything, renouncing everything not necessary. We can use it for Krishna. And the Goswamis also, they utilize wealth. When rich men came to them, then they utilized their wealth to build nice temples for Krishna. Another kind of vairagya is uh, uh, markata vairagya, monkey renunciation. Right? People see the monkeys and they think, oh, these are very renounced. These monkeys, they're really renounced. They live in the tree naked. But we know they're not renounced at all, right? They have so much sense gratification. They're big families, so many wives and so many things, nonsense they're doing. So that's markup vairagya. So actual renunciation is yukta vairagya using everything for the service of Krishna. There's also smasana vairagya. Smasana vairagya, you go to the funeral. When you go to the funeral, somebody died, oh yeah, life is no purpose, there's nothing, no meaning to life, oh yeah. You know, the next day there's a wedding party and everyone is, <laughs> enjoy. Yeah. It's all forgotten about. So smasana vairagya, the renunciation of the crematorium, doesn't last very long. That is also not proper renunciation. Proper renunciation is using everything for the pleasure of Krishna. We want to do that. Okay, so we'll stop. We'll ask, is there any questions? Some questions, something we can elaborate on? Some points maybe I have not covered properly. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for giving your nice association. Uh, Maharaj, uh, here you spoke about uh, daily sadhana. So, actually, in one sense, you know, in 
broke the solution kind of, but it's you know it's not working out. I mean, automatically sadhana goes down. Sometimes like you come from Maharashtra, the you association, we feel it's bad. We go on for some days, but then again you know, it dies down. So. <laughs> Well, I said, you come and live with us, all right? <laughs> That's the solution. You move in the temple. Now many young men are living also in the centers. You can see in Calcutta, Mumbai, Hyderabad, I saw so many young people. They have the job, they go to job, but morning they're living there in the center. Every morning they're Mongolati. They come, morning program, then they go to work. So you can do that. Make us a base. Are you married? Not yet. Oh, very good. You can look <laughs> immediately. You come and look. Yeah, you're a lucky man. You can still come and live with the devotees. Even you're married. We don't mind. You can leave your family. Come and live with us. <laughs> Wife will be happy also. <laughs> Yeah, you have to have association. You're a little weak. In the beginning, you're not able to maintain the sadhana. You need to have association. Maybe somebody needs to call you every morning and ask you, are you up yet? Have you chan how many rounds have you chanted? Some, maybe somebody needs to be calling you to check on you every day. Or if you live with other devotees, somehow or other, you have to make arrangements so that you can keep your sadhana, you can keep up practice, spiritual practice. You don't have the training from your childhood, so you have to get the training now. So the saying in Sanskrit is subhasya sigram, the auspicious thing. You have to do it immediately. Don't waste time. It's better sooner than later. You have to understand how important this is to get the sadhana to just get it ingrained in you just like we see people young people they can stay up all night watching movies or watch bollywood movies the whole night you never feel tired you know watching bollywood movies but wake them up at four o'clock in the morning to chant Hare krishna oh i'm so tired come to hear Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita. Oh, so tired. <laughs> Indra Jumna Maharaj says that Om Namo Bhagavati Mantra is the go to sleep mantra. <laughs> and until they hear Sharera Vijaya, nobody wakes up. <laughs> when they hear the Prasadam prayer, then oh, yes. They come to life. So yes, you have to have determination, that's also required. We have to know how important this sadhana is. If we're thinking, oh well, it doesn't really matter, I can chant later, I can always do more rounds tomorrow to make up for it. You know, we're thinking, it doesn't really matter so much. When you minimize the importance of these things, that's a problem. No, you have to know it's very important this sadhana. You have to do it. You have to be committed. So we have to become more serious about this. Well, we heard, I heard from the, the Chaupati devotees, they were saying that well, one night they were in the building and there was some tremors and there was rumors there was going to be an earthquake. In the middle of the night everyone had to come out of the building. And so it's the middle of the night, they were all outside the building, they were all chanting. They said it was the best rounds they ever chanted. <laughs> because they all thought maybe the ground's going to open up, we're all going to be swallowed, you know. They all thought death is coming any moment, we're all going to die. You know, people were afraid. Then they were really chanting. You know, so if you're thinking like that, like Maharaj Parikshit, seven days to live. He didn't eat, he didn't drink water, he didn't sleep for seven days. He didn't want to waste a moment. We don't know when we're going to die. 
So this sadhana is so important. This is we have to prepare ourselves for getting out of this world. Every moment is important. Prabhupada quoted Chanakya Pandit. He said, you can you can buy you cannot buy a moment of time for any amount of wealth. So don't waste time. And if you're not doing your sadhana, then you're wasting time. You must be. What are you doing? Sleeping. <laughs> doing some other thing. Watching cricket or, you know, Bollywood or something. Yeah, waste, we waste time. We have time to do so many other things. Sadhana, oh, <laughs> tomorrow, next day, next life. <laughs> yeah, we, we want to put everything off. This is very dangerous, very big mistake. We should understand how rare, how fortunate we are to get the association of devotees. It's very rare to get so There's 8 million, 80, 84 lakh species of life and only 4 lakh human species. So we have the human species, that's rare. But even more rare is to get the association of devotees. To have that opportunity to associate with devotees and to practice the principles of Krishna consciousness. You know, there are so many other people, they don't know about sadhana. They never heard about it. Nobody ever told them that they're supposed to wake up early in the morning and chant the holy name. No one taught them to read the scriptures. But we know, if we know these things and we don't do it, then we're really stupid. We're really foolish. We're really wasting the life. Because we've been given the opportunity and we don't take it. Very unfortunate. So we have to become very serious. We have to become very committed to this. That's why initiation is there particularly people who accept initiation from a bona fide spiritual master, then they make a commitment to this thing. They have, they've committed themselves to the practice of chanting the holy name, practicing the regulated principles. <coughs> Prabhupada says, initiation means material life is finished. No more material life. De declaring war on the material energy. So Prabhupada, by giving this Krishna consciousness movement, he gi he's given all of us this opportunity to get out of this material world, to overcome this material energy. If we don't take advantage, when, then we are really foolish. We're really unfortunate. So you have to be determined. So how do you get that determination? Chanting. Everything comes from chanting. You have, we have to really take shelter of the process of chanting the holy name. You have to, we have to really want to get a taste and become committed to that, to doing this chanting. That's our first, should be our first business chant the holy name. Right. So, I would like to know if some, there are some other factors like uh, when I stayed in you know, uh, Goa and Govinda for some time, it was like I was able to do kind of more naturally attend morning program and all these things. Here it naturally becomes very tough. So uh, is there some specific factors that, of, uh, that I should take care of? Association here in Singapore only weekends we get, otherwise it's, you know, very difficult. Well, you have to get a group of devotees together and live with them. Find some other single men, other people who have a desire to practice Krishna consciousness more seriously. There must be some other people in a similar situation to yourself. 
It doesn't have to be many, even one or one or two, but you know, if you get a, somebody has some a, a company with you, then it's much easier. You help each other to do the chant, to take part in chanting. I remember when I first came to Singapore, that must have been 1990s, uh, in Spottiswood Park, there were some devotees living there. There was a group of young men at that time. They were all living there. They, were, they had rented an apartment. And they were staying together. We didn't have the Goranga Hall at that time. <laughs> but they were living together. So you have to you have to try to arrange that, you know. Put some message on the internet that I'm looking for some people who are interested come together. And Krishna, you'll see people are there, definitely people are there, everywhere. So many young men are very happy to have that kind of situation. Yeah, so you have to simply find some people, get some group, make a group together and find a place. Problem solved. Hmm? There's a number of Bengali devotees, probably. They're probably they have probably they have a center, they have a place. They're living together. Yeah, I'm sure you can do it. Yeah. Prabhu? Yeah, you spoke about Yukta Vera again. And uh, sometimes places like Singapore, uh, where many of us are working, in the name of keeping our jobs or to be able to preach in our social circles, we we try to, you know, we may be overindulging, over endeavoring. We don't know. So as neophyte devotees, how do we keep check and balance whether we are over endeavoring just to maintain or we are uh, going over limit? Yes, interesting point. We often hear people say, I'm doing this in the set for Krishna Prabhu. <laughs> I, I bought my new Lexus for the service of Krishna Prabhu. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> interesting. You know, what we say is, we're doing this, I'm getting this new apartment for the service of Krishna. When Guru Maharaj comes, he'll come and stay here, you know. And of course, Guru Maharaj will come maybe one, two nights in a year or even less. <laughs> and the rest of the year, you know, you enjoy the new apartment. <laughs> so, what is Yukta Vairagya? What is the proper level of Yukta Vairagya? How to understand these things? We have to be guided by Shastra, Sadhu, Guru. If we're not sure yourself, if we think maybe it's some sense gratification, then you can inquire from others, what do you think? Is it, do you think it's allowed? Is it, do you think it's a good idea or not? You have to consider also, are you getting overly attached to this? If we're becoming too much attached to it, then it's not good. If you can accept the opulence, if you can accept it without you know, being this without being over, overwhelmed by it. In other words, you you know, you get the new car, you become very proud. The ego, you know, I am Lexus, I am you know, Rolls Royce or whatever. You know, our if our ahankara, that false ego, is increasing, then that's not good, right? We want to consider opulence and everything as a gift of Krishna by the grace of Krishna who are given these things. And so we recognize whatever we have in the world as gifts, blessings from Krishna. But if we're for becoming forgetful of Krishna as a, on account of the opulence, then it's not good. We see Sudama, I give an example of Sudama that Krishna, when he went, when Sudama went home and Krishna had given him that beautiful big house and 
his wife was all dressed in beautiful clothes and jewelry and they had servants and so much opulent. The Sudama accepted all of that opulence in the mood of renunciation. It increased his devotion to Krishna. So if opulence and sense gratification, if, if it's helping us to become more conscious of Krishna, then, then it's very good. If you're, if, if you're thinking more about Krishna, then the, there's no harm. Definitely, that's what we want. We want to be able to remember Krishna. But if we're thinking, by my hard work, I have got this, I have been successful, I have worked hard, so I'm having... We have to understand everything is the blessings of Krishna, the grace of Krishna. Krishna gives, Krishna takes. A devotee surrenders to Krishna. Sometimes Krishna gives and sometimes Krishna takes. Devotee always remains surrendered servant. Prabhupada said his father used to tell him, God is like a person with ten arms. So if somebody with ten arms wants to give, he can give so much. And if that same person with ten arms wants to take, then he can take everything. But the body remains surrendered to Krishna. If he takes or if he gives, this is Krishna's mercy, Krishna's arrangement. Krishna knows what is good for us. So yeah, people do, we do have that tendency as devotees, we talk about, oh, this is for Krishna Prabhu, it's all for Krishna. Hmm. Yeah, we have, we have to, who knows if it's for Krishna or not. Well, the time of death, we'll find out, right? That's the real task. The final exam comes at the end of life. If we're able to remember Krishna, if we're able to attach ourselves to Krishna, we're not attached to the opulence. So, sense gratification. We have the highest sense gratification. Right? In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Vishaya vinivartante nirahrasya dehina raso varyam raso piyajya param dristva nivartante. Krishna talks about the higher taste. So it's not no taste. We don't want to give up sense gratification. We want the higher taste. We want the ultimate sense gratification. The highest sense gratification comes in serving Krishna. Chanting and dancing, taking prasadam. Prabhupada said this is a movement of recreation only. Simply recreation. Chanting, dancing, taking Krishna prasada. Very joyful. Devotees are joyful souls. Brahma Buddha Prasanatma. The spiritual pleasure. That is real sense gratification. But materialistic people, their sense gratification is punas puna charvita charvananam they're simply chewing the chewed if you have to chew the sugar cane after all the juice has been taken out there's no more taste there so sense gratification in material life is like that therefore so many people become disappointed with the material world they become they they, they want to go away from the world because they find everything to be so dry, no real pleasure in it. And we see even some of the richest people in the world are the most unhappy. There's no real sense gratification, just trying to enjoy the senses without Krishna. But as soon as you bring Krishna into the picture, then you can experience the spiritual 
So that is a higher taste. We want the higher taste, not the stones. The child may be eating stones in the mouth. The mother would say, take the stones out. The child wants to have something in the mouth, he won't take the stones out. Then the mother will give some candy. And as soon as he puts some sweets in the mouth, then the child is happy. So, like that. We're trying to chew stones. We're trying to get pleasure where there is no real pleasure. But there is pleasure on the higher platform, on the spiritual platform. Spiritual pleasure. Pleasure of the soul. Okay, so we will stop here tonight. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada. Ki. Jai. Jai.